Hello students, I'd like to talk to you today about experiment two, which is about stoichiometry and thermochemistry. And one of the cool things about this experiment is that you're going to be trying different ratios of reactants in order to identify the stoichiometric ratio for your unknown. And so you'll see some ratios that are good and some that are better and some that are the best. This reminded me of Dallin Oaks's talk, Good, Better, and Best, from October 2017. He said, we should begin by recognizing the reality that just because something is good is not a sufficient reason for doing it. The number of good things we can do far exceeds the time available to accomplish them. Some things are better than good, and these are the things that should command priority attention in our lives. Some uses of individual and family time are better and others are best. We have to forego some good things in order to choose others that are better or best because they develop faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and strengthen our families. So our learning objectives today are to define endo and exothermic, define and describe the system and surroundings in the experiment, explain how calorimetry is used to measure the heat of the reaction, and also calculate the heat of reaction based on calorimetric measurements. We're going to use Job's method to determine the stoichiometry of the reaction and identify the limiting reagent. And our process skill for today will be problem solving. One of the things that I think is really unique about this experiment is that you are unlikely to have a plan at the beginning that will work perfectly. So you actually are going to have to reevaluate and replan in the middle of the experiment. And that's totally normal. But um, because of that, it also gives you an opportunity to work on problem solving. And there are four parts to problem solving. Analyzing a problem to identify what information is needed, what information we have, arriving at a strategy that is functional and optimal. And this is one where I think you may notice um, in retrospect, when you get to the end, maybe your strategy worked, but it wasn't the best strategy and there could have been a different way to go about it. So pay attention to that as you're sort of self-evaluating at the end of today. Um, executing the strategy, implementing it effectively, and then uh, arriving at a solution that's reasonable and addresses all parts of the problem. This is a reaction between barium hydroxide and ammonium chloride, and it actually will get very, very cold. So what they've done here is they put the reaction in the beaker and they sprayed a little bit of water on this wood board, and then they put the beaker on top. And the reaction gets so cold it actually freezes the water. And so you'll see he'll be able to pick up the board after the reaction is done. What'd you do? So um, in this case, the reaction is so cold. So this is what I'd like you to do is pause the video here and take a moment to ask yourself, is it endo or exothermic? And what happens to the stability of the molecules comparing the reactants to the products? In fact, this reaction is endothermic, meaning it's absorbing heat from the surroundings, and that's why it feels cold. So for example, if your hand is holding the beaker, it would feel cold because heat is traveling from your hand into the system to, um, that heat gets absorbed in those molecules. And that means that the molecules that are the products are actually higher energy than the molecules that were in the reactants. They're less stable. Stability is related to enthalpy. If you have more enthalpy, you're more unstable. And if you have less enthalpy, you're more stable. So there's a few places where this comes into play in your real life. For example, you might experience uh, cooling off when you start sweating after you've been exercising. That's your body's way of cooling down. And the reason it works is because the water molecules evaporate and that's an endothermic process. So the water molecules in your sweat, when they evaporate, are um, take with them heat from your body. That helps to cool you down. Cold packs and hot packs are other examples you've probably seen in your regular life where you can shake them up and they get cold or shake it up and it gets hot. And um, those are also 
examples of endo and exothermic reactions. And of course, something like burning the fuel in a car makes the engine warm, that's an exothermic reaction. Now, you guys have seen this before in Chem 105 and Chem 106, and what we want to do here is talk about a reaction coordinate diagram. So I'll show you one in a minute, but I'm not going to show it to you yet. So what's going to happen in this video, we have Dr. Asplund here, and he's going to show us a demo of a hydrogen balloon and an ethane balloon. And I want you to look for two things when this is happening, the speed of the reaction, which is indicated by how loud the boom is. The louder it is, the faster the reaction happens. And uh, the amount of heat released. And in the video, you won't be able to feel it like you would if it were in the classroom, but you can uh, substitute in how big the sort of flame ball is that comes out of the balloon. That will substitute for the amount of heat that's released. And what I'd like you to do is uh, think about what did you observe for these two things and then how would the reaction coordinate diagrams be different for hydrogen versus ethane? And so I'd like you to use the evidence from the video, from what you see, to support your claim about how those reaction, diagram would, reaction diagrams would be different. So here's hydrogen burning. A fairly loud bang, but very little flame. We can compare that now to the burning of our ethane balloon. Ethane has more atoms in it, there are more bonds breaking and forming during the reaction, and therefore more energy will be released during our combustion. Okay, so uh, you should have observed here that the boom was louder for hydrogen than it was for ethane, and the flame was bigger for ethane than it was for hydrogen. So from those two pieces of information, we should assume that our hydrogen balloon happens faster because of the boom and that our ethane balloon is more exothermic because of the flame. And the way that would translate into our uh, reaction coordinate diagrams is if we had hydrogen over here on the left, for ethane, we would see a larger hill um, because it happened a little bit slower hence the quieter boom, and we would see a deeper uh, products over here on the right because the enthalpy change would be larger. So we could make a claim the activation energy would be higher for ethane, and the reason we know is because there was a small boom and slower reactions will have higher activation energies. And likewise, we can make a claim for the products being lower, and uh, our evidence would be that large flame ball that we saw. If you were in the room, you would have felt the heat all the way in the back row of the lecture hall. And if it's releasing more heat, then we expect that delta H will also be larger. So these are some reaction coordinate diagrams. These are labeled with um, delta G or free energy, but you can have similar diagrams with delta H. And essentially, the smaller this activation energy uh, from the reactants to the activated complex, the faster that reaction is going to be. And then the bigger this difference down here between where you start and where you end, the more exothermic it is going to be. Now in today's experiment, you're going to be doing calorimetry. And you have a dram vial, that's this kind of conical vial here. And our rudimentary calorimeter is a piece of styrofoam that will go around our vial. And the system is actually the chemical reaction here. And when chemical reactions have a change in enthalpy, there will be heat that's released. And the way we relate them is that Q of the reaction equals N, which is the number of moles of reaction, times delta H. N is the number of moles of reactant divided by its stoichiometric coefficient. In other words, we want the moles of the whole reaction overall, so we're going to kind of temper the size of our moles by dividing by the stoichiometric coefficient for any particular reactant. Delta H is going to be the standard molar enthalpy change for the reaction. Now the surroundings 
is our solution. So the reaction is actually happening inside the solution, and we can't really separate these things. So in fact, we don't measure the change in enthalpy from the reaction. The thing that we measure is the heat that's, that's absorbed by the solution. And the formula for that heat is Mc delta T. M is the mass of the whole solution. So we're gonna assume in this case, because it's a dilute solution, that the density is the same as water. C is the specific heat of the solution. And again, we're gonna assume it's the same as water. And delta T is the change in temperature for the solution. So you'll measure it heating up and that will give you your delta T for the reaction. Now we know because of the conservation of energy that whatever heat is lost by our reaction has to be absorbed by the solution. Or if we added them together, the change would be zero because energy is conserved. Um, and so knowing that these are equal and opposite, we can solve for our delta H using negative MC delta T over N. So that's the uh, formula that you're gonna need for this next practice problem. So go ahead and pause the video here, see if you can identify all of the variables and then solve for delta H. This is our list of variables here. The mass is 10 grams. Our C is the same as water. Our change in temperature is 9.2 degrees Celsius. And then for N, we're doing, again, the number of moles of our NaOCl, but we divide by three because its coefficient in this chemical reaction is three. So it's the number of moles of the reactant divided by its stoichiometric coefficient equals our N, which is 0 0.00125. And if we calculate delta H, we should get negative 308 kilojoules per mole. In our experiment, we're gonna be identifying the stoichiometric ratio. And so an important concept for us to understand is called the limiting reactant. This is the reactant that runs out. It gets completely used up and it limits how much product can be formed. And in our case, it's gonna limit how much heat can be released when we do this reaction. So as an example, if we had hydrogen and oxygen, the optimal ratio is a two to one ratio of hydrogen to oxygen. And so if we looked at the amount of water that was being formed, we'd see there would be more water formed up here and less water formed at other stoichiometric ratios. That's what you're gonna be doing today in lab. You're gonna be preparing these solutions that have different ratios of your reactants and products. And you're gonna find which one is at the peak that's the most efficient. That's when you have gotten to the stoichiometric ratio. One part of the lab report is an error analysis, and this has to include a description of the error, uh, state which measurements would be affected, and also how the final answer for delta H would change, if it would be too high or too low. And you should also say ways that you might be able to reduce the error if possible. One example is uh, you poured the reagent into your dram vial, but some of it remained in the graduated cylinder. How would this affect your result? Well, if it's the limiting reactant, then you would have less heat produced from the reaction because you'd be limiting it more. And then your delta T would be too small and your delta H would also be too small. But what if it were the excess reactant? If it's the excess reactant, the same amount of heat gets released, but there's actually less solution there to heat up. And so your delta T would be bigger and your delta H would also be bigger. So those are two examples of how you might uh, describe the error analysis. What you want to avoid is saying something like you calculated incorrectly or measured incorrectly because those aren't errors, they're mistakes. When you're in lab today, you want to observe all of the appropriate safety precautions, wearing long pants, closed-toed shoes, goggles, and a lab coat. Um, we won't require you to wear gloves for this lab. We will require you to wear a mask as usual. The solutions that we're using in this experiment all contain sodium hydroxide, so that's considered a skin and eye irritant. It's pretty low concentration, but um, you should be aware of that. And if you spilled any on your skin, make sure that you wash it off with plenty of water. Um, sodium sulfate and sodium hypochlorite are skin and eye irritants also. Uh, so again, beware of getting those on your skin and especially not getting them in your eyes. Sodium hypochlorite, which is um, 
the reagent that you're testing the ratio of with your unknown is the main ingredient in bleach. And so it will bleach your clothing and other belongings. So just be careful with that while you're in lab. That's the end. So good luck with experiment two. And thanks for watching.